Hey friends, welcome back to another episode of Christ and Me with Addie, where we seek to live out a John 3.30 life. John 3.30 says he must become greater and greater and I less and less. Let's be real. In today's world, it can seem impossible to live out what the Bible calls us to do. Not only can it be hard to understand sometimes, but finding the time to read the Bible, to understand the Bible, to know the Bible, it can just be overwhelming. So I created this podcast so we could walk alongside each other, share some of our stories and struggles, but also where the Lord is bringing us so that we can encourage one another and stay rooted in his word. It's my prayer that you walk away from each episode saying, I know that that is Christ in me. I know Christ in me. So let's get into today's topic. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Christ in Me with Addie, where today I'm joined by one of my friends. And I was trying to think of how long we've been friends. I think it's been like four years. Like 2021, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, 2020, craft gym there's the like weight stuff back there and they have a a wheat mill everything you could ever want they have there's there's the wheat mill right there so that is so funny but yeah whenever I'm feeling like I need to get out some stress I go over to Kelly's house and we either bake things together like macaroons or cakes or I watch her mill her wheat and we just find fun new crafts to do but yeah Kelly's one of my great friends And I wanted to bring her on the show today to talk not only a little bit about her life and what that looks like, but the topic today is denominational differences. And this is one that people ask me about all the time. Like, what's the, what's the right version of the Bible to read? Or what's, what's the right, you know, denomination? Should I be Catholic? Should I be non-denominational? Should I be Baptist? And so you have a really interesting family dynamic, which I love. And I feel like God place specifically you into my life to bring some healing to my life because denomina- denominational differences really caused a big riff in my family. And so seeing your family and how beautifully you guys integrate two denominations and just keep the Lord at the center has been something that is so inspiring to me. So Kelly, why don't you tell a little bit about you know who you are? Mm-hmm. You can talk about maybe your childhood, your, your parents' faith, just tell us about what your life looked like growing up. Yeah. Um, so I'm from a really small town in the middle of nowhere. I think it's bigger than your town, actually, but we had about 6,000 people. Um, and our work- That is bigger. To, I, say, I think it's a little bigger, yeah. <laughs> our claim to fame is the world's largest washing machine factory. So wow. we can hook you up if you need that. Um, <laughs> but small house, we had, I have two siblings. My brother is 22 now, and he's adopted from Guatemala. Um, and my sister is 34, so she's three years older than me. Um, and both of my parents, I don't actually think my dad was Christian when my parents got married. Um, Mm. so my grandparents actually on my mom's side were, they had some semblance of faith. Um, but then my grandparents on my dad's side did not at all until my grandpa had this like huge conversion of faith, um, Mm. I don't think I was born yet, but it was like he was smoking and drinking and then just like cold turkey to all of that. And he actually became a pastor. Um, wow. And so like that, I don't remember exactly when that happened in their relationship, but um, by the time I was around, they both had a faith level and we always went to church. Um, we kind of not church hopped, but we started at like a small church in Clyde. It was a Methodist church. And then we moved to another church near the town I grew up in um, until I was like 11 and nine or actually, I think I was in like third grade. And then we moved to Grace Community Church in Fremont. Um, and when we first started going there, there was like three, 400 people. And that's where we continued to go through the rest of my childhood. And by the time I left, they would sometimes have like 1700 people on the weekends. So wow. huge growth. Um, and I was actually still am, um, one of my best friends is the pastor's daughter. So, um, good connections there. Um, as far as like faith in our family kind of went, Christopher and I were talking about it recently because like my parents definitely laid some kind of foundation because I mean, I stuck with it and like my 
brother has some semblance of it and my sister has some semblance of it. Um, I'm not entirely sure always where we're all at together on that, but there's some semblance of it. And like my, we always pray before meals. And I remember us having like this little box and it was like, when we got our allowance, a little bit went in savings and then in spending and then in tithing. So like Mm. there was this presence of it. And I remember doing devotionals with my dad. Um, and there were, he actually on the side was the janitor for the church's preschool. And so he'd go over there Monday through Thursday in the evenings. And I would sometimes go with him and I'd help him clean. And we'd have these really deep conversations in the car on the way. Um, but like, I don't remember a lot more of like really intense presence of it during high school. Um, so it was there, but like, I've had people talk about how like over the dinner table, they had these really in-depth faith conversations. And like, we never did that, that I can remember. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was, there's a presence there. And actually my mom, I've actually seen her read her Bible a lot more now. Mm -hmm. Um, and my parents are actually divorced now. So they got divorced when I was 23 or 24. Um, and whole story in itself, but they're both married now to other people and some semblance of faith there again. Like, I'm not sure how much my dad goes to church. And then my mom and my stepdad, Ray, they go pretty regularly on Sundays. So there's like a presence there. Um, I don't know. It's an interesting relationship with it. Like I'm Christopher and I have been trying to figure out like where it all fits in, but like, it's not Mm -hmm. like it was absent, but I don't feel like it was like thrown in my face every day either. Yeah. And it's crazy to hear because I feel like you have such strong faith now. Like you're that friend that I always call or, you know, vent to for advice. And so it's cool to see how you've made your faith your own. So when do you think that you accepted Jesus? And what did that look like for you when you knew, like, I want to follow you forever? So I know that I was like four or five and my mom and I talked through like what it meant to have Jesus in your life and in your heart. And I, she prayed with me then. So like, I know that was like the beginning of it. Um, I was baptized when I was like 11 with my dad and my sister. And Mm then um, there's like times after that where I feel like I think a lot of my faith throughout high school and even early college was kind of like surface level. So what it meant to me in my brain was I I really struggle with perfectionism. Um, Mm -hmm. And so like in my brain, sometimes it was not even like this relationship with the Lord as it was like trying to figure out how to be the perfect Christian. And so I spent a lot of times like we would do youth group sermons and I would hear something they'd talk about. And then I'd be like, huh, I got to go change that part of my life because I did this wrong. And then mm-hmm. it would like go up and down. And like, that was my understanding of what it meant to be a Christian was like, what are all the things I'm supposed to be doing and not supposed to be doing? Um, but then in college, and actually, I mean, it will play into it. I think Christopher is a huge reason why my faith is the way it is now. Um, and we started dating when I was 19. So mm-hmm. most of my college career. Um, in college, that's where I feel like it started to become a little bit more of my own. And honestly, Mm -hmm. in the past six and a half years that we've been married is when it's really started to flourish. Yeah. And like I said, you guys, I mean, you're just some of the strongest, you're one of the couples that I think has like this, some of the strongest faith in my, in my life. And so it's been cool again, to see how you've made it work despite denominational differences. I know you already name dropped him, but Christopher is her (laughs) husband to everyone. And um, I mentioned this a little bit. We're going to segue into kind of your relationship and those denominational differences. But denominational differences caused a huge rift in my family to the point where some family members did not come to our wedding because it wasn't of their Christian denomination. So they felt like they couldn't come. And it's just been really healing for me to to witness your relationship and see how you make it work. And I know it's not perfect and Mm -hmm. no relationship is. That's why we need God, right? But share a little bit about the denomination that you are and then the denomination that your husband is and, um, you know, how that kind of started, I guess. Sure. Um, So I'm non-denominational, have been since we went to Grace Community um, and have kind of spent some time when I came to Columbus trying to find where I kind of fit. And I've been at the church next door since 2016. So, which is crazy. It's been like eight years. Mm -hmm. Um, And then my husband is Catholic and he actually, they were kind of like nominally Catholic um, Mm -hmm. for a long time up until about when Christopher was in maybe middle school or high school. And then his dad had this like deeper falling into the faith and like really instilled that into him. And now he and his brother are both really devout Catholics. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't remember what the rest of your question was. Oh, I was just going to tell a quick story. So I'm glad you forgot. I still remember when 
I first met Christopher's brother and I was single. <laughs> and you were like, I think you said he won't go for you because you're not Catholic. Sorry. Like, no. <laughs> and that so, there's, yes. there's some differences <laughs> in that regard. Yes. Right. No, I it's funny now. Together either, though. But they they are very devout Catholic. And having yes. some Catholic fa- family members, I understand why. Catholics try to marry within the Catholic mm-hmm. denomination just because there are really big theological differences. So when you met your husband, I- I'd love to hear your like love story, how you yeah. how you fell in love, but also whether or not you felt any like tension because of the denominational differences while you were dating. So we actually lived in Lincoln Tower, which is one of, and if you've ever been by Ohio State, it's one of the two big giant towers by the um like stadium. And so we both lived on the 19th floor there and I was in one suite and he was in the suite right next to me of boys. So like first into college, we were both 18 and we met as friends. Um, and we were actually just friends for the first year. And then we were like friends where we were pretending (laughs) to be friends, but we both liked each other. And like, there's just still like some high school level college drama that we just, we waited for a little while before we ended up officially dating when we were in our sophomore year. Um, and I mean, I, will brag on him all the time, but I feel like he's my own like Nicholas Sparks Hallmark movie novel, whatever you want to say. <laughs> um, like our first date, we went like where we lived, you would walk across the bridge and there was like Target and movies and things like that. And we went over to had coffee or in my case, I think I had apple cider because I don't like coffee. Um, <laughs> and then we went to a movie and then it was raining. So we danced in the rain and then we like played out on the bridge in the rain. And it was just like perfect brain. And obviously this was like little girl in love. So who knows how much it was actually perfect, but, Mm -hmm. um, and that's honestly a good picture of how our relationship has been. He's very sweet and intentional. Um, and I remember pretty shortly into us dating that I don't remember which one of us brought it up, but I had had in high school and actually all of the boys, I feel like I had dated until him were not like really devout Christian. And I just remember Mm -hmm. thinking like, I I need to have this like equally yoked person. So like really shortly into us dating, we were like, where do you stand on this? And he was like, I love God. And I was like, great, me too. And then we just like stopped. And that was the end of the conversation at that point. Um, Yeah. But as we kind of got more serious. So for me in the town that I'm from, small town, everybody gets married really young. So Mm -hmm. we were like 21 and I was like, all right, well, let's talk about getting married. And he's from Chicago. And at least for his understanding, bigger city people didn't get married as young. So he was like, excuse me, what? Um, (laughs) And, but regardless, that kind of kickstarted us having some like deeper conversations. And that's actually during like this two year period of when I brought it up to when we actually got engaged, we argued all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was denominational differences at that point. Like it was a lot of then we were like, oh, this is like real. Like if we, if we get married, we need to somehow blend this together. And there are some big differences, um, but we were coming at it like, I feel like I would come at him like, well, you're different here and you're wrong. And he's like, well, you're different here and you're wrong. And it was just this constant, like, neither one of us were willing to see the other person's side. Mm -hmm. Um, And then we actually, I think we had gotten engaged finally, but then we were, either we had gotten engaged or it was right before we got engaged. And we talked to one of his um, priests at the Newman Center on campus and this really wonderful man. And he kind of just broached the subject to us in a way that he was like, well, have you guys thought about or looked at each other and tried to figure out how you're similar or like what, mm. what are the levels where they're the same? And we were like, oh, that like blew our minds. Like what level are we the same? And I feel like that completely shifted and changed the way we were approaching these conversations and discussions as opposed to this like animosity and anger where mm-hmm. we were mad that the other one was different. It was more like a well, why do you do it this way? Like, where does this come from? Let me yeah. understand this. Um, and a lot of times I think that's that's more how our conversations go now. And mm-hmm. through that, we found a lot more similarities. Um, at the heart and center of it, we're the same. Um, we both love Jesus, know that he's the only way that we can get to heaven. Um, mm-hmm. And then there's some differences, obviously. I mean, if you've ever met a Catholic and a non-denominational, there are differences. Um mm-hmm. But like the heart and soul of it kind of is the same. And I feel like as we've further developed our relationship and our marriage since then, it's been a lot more of us trying to figure out like, well, how do these things kind of fit together? Um, Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. And I call them primary and secondary theological differences Mm -hmm. because I think when we're talking about Christianity as a whole, 
primary theological beliefs would be like that Jesus died and raised for our sins, that all humans are born with an inherent sinful nature. Um, Those are primary theological issues. I would say secondary theological issues would be how worship is conducted, whether or not a church allows drums, um, how communion is conducted, things like that. And so you had mentioned the verse 2 Corinthians 6, 14, which says, do not be unequally yoked. Mm -hmm. Did you ever feel that in your denominational differences or how do you interpret that verse um, when it comes to having denominational differences? Or even if someone doesn't know what that verse means, you could explain it first and then get into that. I feel like we... I don't think I ever thought like I was unequally yoked because I feel like in my definition of what an unequally yoked would be is like a Christian and a non-Christian or like Christian and someone that's Jewish. Like if you guys are on very separate beliefs, like I know people that have like Jewish and Christian parents and they celebrate Hanukkah and Christmas. And uh, that's not what I feel like I was looking for in a marriage because that felt like unequally yeah. yoked to me. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that being said though, I think that I've never talked with his brother about it, but his brother might think that if he married a Protestant person, that would be unequally yoked for him. I don't know. Mm. Um, But at least from my understanding and where we both came to it, it was more of a, like, are we both Christian? Because Catholic is Christian and Protestant is Christian. Um, Are we both Christian? Do we both have that same core set of beliefs? And are we both geared and ready to have this equal household where we raise our son in Jesus's love? And yes, we do. And so... Mm -hmm. um, I, again, like there were definitely differences and we argued trying to figure out how to fit them. And there are times where I think both of us were like, life would just be easier if you were blank. Like if I was Catholic yeah. or if he was Protestant, because like, there are some things that we just won't be able to participate with each other fully. Um, but I wouldn't say that I felt like we were ever not matched on that like mm-hmm. core theology in the same way. Yeah. I mean, being a part of your guys' lives, you're so in love, like it's evident. And so I've never once questioned whether or not God put the two of you together. And I think this is just one of the the challenges that's like one of your crosses to bear, I guess. But it's, like I said, it's been a testament in my life. And you hit that spot on with that verse because the full verse is, do not be un- unequally yoked with unbelievers for what uh, union can righteousness have with lawlessness. And so spot on. I feel like a lot of Christians use that verse to defend like, well, if you're Catholic, you can't be with a a Baptist. Or like, if you're a non-denom, you have to date with a non-denom. And, you know, everybody's so pointed as to like, my denomination is the right one when Paul advocated for like unity in the church. And so something I've loved, again, just about witnessing your relationship is you really have embodied that so well that it's just about Christ at the end of the day. And it is possible to lead non-denominational differences in love and like, not Mm -hmm. just in love, but maintain a marriage through it. So what does a Sunday look like for your family with denominational differences? So different before our son. So my son is seven months old a few days ago. Um, Mm -hmm. And before he was born, we pretty regularly would go to mass and then we would go to the church next door. So mass within my, my service. Um, and just depending on timing, just depended on when we got up for the day. Um, and so that was pretty much our normal Sundays. It would vary a little bit if, um, he was lecturing. So sometimes he lectures at mass and reads some of the, um, old Testament or new Testament. And on those days, like we would have to be there at that time. Or if I'm on worship team at church, cause then I'm pretty much out for Saturday and then most of Sunday morning. So like those mm-hmm. days he would go to mass and then he'd come back to um, sit while I sang and, we, and then we'd sit together and um, listen to the rest of service. Now it's been, and my, I do remember like my mom mentioning at one point, I think you might ask this question later, but like about us when we were talking about getting married and doing two church services, she's like, we're not going to do that forever. And I remember mm-hmm. at the time being really defensive and being like, yeah, we are. It's really hard. Um, yeah. and it's, it's been really hard since having a son, but the bigger issue is just because of his naps. Like he's mm-hmm. just little and he can't hang for very long. So like right now he at this stage can stay awake for like two and a half to three and a half hours, depending on where he's at, which is way better than when he was little. And it was like 45 minutes to an hour and 15. Um, and everybody always says that babies just sleep and our baby did not just sleep. Like he is much better now. Um, 
but I mean, there were times where it would take us hours to get him to fall asleep. And yeah. he's this newborn that really needs a lot of sleep. Um, so for us to be able to just go out and be like, yeah, he'll sleep while we're out. I, not guaranteed, actually pretty unlikely that he's just going to sleep while we're out. So, mm-hmm. um, even like to go to mass, we would normally get up, go. And like, while we were at mass, that was longer than his wake window was going to be. So we were like gambling. Mm-hmm. Is he going to fall asleep at mass? Are we going to have an overly tired baby when we come home? Um, So sometimes what we would do is go to mass, come home, bring him for a nap, and then take go to the church next door and then come home for the day. Now, sometimes it's just depends on what we get to. Um, For him, then if there's anybody Catholic listening, like I'm probably going to butcher some of the things he's taught me. So give me some grace Mm -hmm. there. But um, (laughs) he... Like there's the idea that like you really should be going to mass every single Sunday. Like that's, Mm -hmm. it's an obligation. Um, And I actually, we've been listening to a Bible in the year recently and they kind of explain where that comes from. And it's with Mm -hmm. the idea that um, like Jesus instituted the last supper at Passover. And so it's kind of like a new Passover. Um, So really you should be going every Sunday. So we pretty much always go to mass, Um, whether or not we make it to the church next door is kind of up in the air. I think we Mm -hmm. will get back into that. Once Micah gets a little bit older and we get a better semblance of what, like how to kind of get mm-hmm. navigate the wake windows and things like that, we will. Um, but to do both is pretty hard right now. Yeah. Um, and I'm, so I was raised Catholic for those listening who haven't heard my testimony episode. I was raised Catholic and I'm now non-denominational, but that was instilled to me from the Catholic church. Like I never missed I think I was really sick one Sunday, but in 18 years, I never missed a single church service because my dad was the same way. Like you go to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, like, I know that's a more traditional take, but I, I now look back and I really appreciate that because it's instilled in me that discipline. And if you're not disciplined for the Lord, it's really easy to fall out of your spiritual practices and habits with God. And so I'm just really proud of you guys that it would be much easier to just watch online because even Catholic services are streamed now. Sure, It would be so much easier to just watch online. And I'm sure maybe you have one weekend or, or so, I don't know. But um, I'm just proud of you guys for still pushing through, even with how difficult it's been with your son's nap schedule. And this is just a quick fun side story, but I always know how old my marriage is because uh, Kelly's son, she was actually supposed to be a bridesmaid in my wedding, but she had her son on my wedding day. So yes. it's really special that we get to share that date together. My marriage is seven days and seven months and a few days old now. Yep. So whenever I, I'll never forget because I just have to ask Kelly how old her son is. Yep. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So next question for you, did your family members, you had mentioned that your mom was like, oh, you can't do that forever. But did any family members like warn your husband or warn you against denominational differences and just, or like even a pastor, did anyone tell you like, this isn't going to work? So I I would say that is one thing, um, at least that I've noticed anytime, like I've seen people get married in the Catholic church is like, they're not normally actually against somebody non-Catholic getting married. Now you have to be baptized. Um, you don't have to be baptized Catholic, but you have to be baptized. Um, and I was, so that's that's fine. Um, but other than that, like I, I know many people that are like Catholic and then not Catholic, and that's mm-hmm. not uncommon actually in the Catholic Church. Um, so really, we didn't have any um, people on that side like dissuade us. Like when we were searching and trying to figure that out, um, one of the things they do go through and like pre-cano, which is like premarital counseling and some of the other things though, is they do instill like, are you okay with him raising your son in this Catholic faith? And like, yeah, I'm absolutely okay with him displaying that and encouraging him in that. Um, cause I mean, he has a beautiful faith, but then, mm-hmm. um, and on my side, I didn't, I don't feel like I really ever gave anybody the opportunity in regards to like our pastors. Cause I remember sitting down with my friend's dad. So my pastor growing up and we were kind of, he was just asking me about Christopher and I feel like I was ready for him to ask me questions and be defensive. So I like jumped in and wanted to explain right away, like, well, he's Catholic, but, and I like explained all of these reasons why it's great that he's Catholic, but it's okay. And he honestly was just Mm -hmm. like, okay. and never like (laughs) pushed it. Um, on my family side, like Nobody ever actually questioned it. My mom did bring that up. And mm-hmm. I remember her, remember her saying, kind of jokingly, I'm pretty sure in the beginning when we first started dating, to not tell my grandmother that he was Catholic because my grandmother oh, no. was still, <laughs> well, she was still alive at that time. And I think like at least the stigma that she had of Catholicism was not great. And I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, Maybe a Catholic was, broke her heart. 
Yeah, I don't think I don't think it was it was something I don't know something about them being mean I don't remember it must have just been like the people she had interacted with and so then she had this vision of what they were and so she was like my mom was like your grandmother's mm-hmm. not gonna love that he's Catholic my grandmother ended up dying bef- like before we were married anyway but then she never said anything and she loved on Christopher but uh, but otherwise like I don't remember much more from my family's side like they would ask questions kind of what mm-hmm. life will look like for us afterwards um on his side, I don't know. Um, we've kind of talked through it some, and I am would be astounded if his brother did not have some kind of conversations with him about it. Like his brother is, yeah. loves the Lord, like really mm-hmm. loves faith, and he really wants to do right in the eyes of the, of God. So he comes from a really great place from that perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm not sure if he had some conversations with him, like in regards to that. I would be surprised if they hadn't. Um, mm-hmm. And the same thing with his dad. I'm sure that they had some kind of conversations with it. Um, at least from what Christopher told me when he first broached the subject of us getting married, I think the bigger thing for them was they were like, wow, you guys are young. We were like 23 mm. at that time, which again, like to me was not young to them was young. Cause like his yeah. parents got married when they were like 29 or 30, I believe. Um, so like, it just made sense that you get married older. So that was at least my understanding of more what the conversation was about, But his dad actually gave us this huge list of, like, things to talk through before we got even engaged. Mm. Um, And not, like, you must do these things, but it was just, like, all of these things to, like, think about, discuss, where are you at on this, finances, all of these different things. And so, like, I never at least felt like it was a, well, she's Protestant, so, like, figure her out. It was more like a, you guys are going to get married, figure this out. Um, But I'm actually not sure on, like, what kind of their own personal individual conversations were other than, like, some of the stuff he said. And there might be some things that they talked about that he just never discussed with me, and Mm -hmm. that's okay. But nothing, like, glaring that I can remember, at least from any side. That's good. And I think the biggest takeaway from that is, okay, maybe his brother talked to him, maybe his dad talked to him, but they still have a relationship. Like, yeah. yeah. And I think that's where, I say this all the time, um, but disagreement does not equal disrespect. And I think Mm -hmm. that's something that our world has a really hard time accepting, whether it's denominational differences or even like sexual preferences, whatever, like too often we see someone as different as the enemy. And so I think it's really great um, that if his family did approach him, you know, they have such love for you. That's evident too, because his brother visits you guys all the time. Sure. um, So it's just really cool how this is clearly God's plan and you guys have just worked through it. So with the denominational differences, what parts of your relationship can like you not participate in at Catholic church or Mm -hmm. ones that he doesn't participate in, in non-denominational church, which is also called the Protestant church as well for anybody listening who's not sure. So um, biggest things is communion. And so Mm -hmm. anybody that's Catholic, um, Well, ideally, and from the way he's described it to me, too, is it's not even just anybody that's Catholic, um, but truly, they believe that the um, host, so the bread or the unleavened kind of wafer that they have, and the The wine. The Eucharist. Yes, the Eucharist. um, The wine become like the literal body and blood of Christ. Just Mm -hmm. um, It's from various portions of the gospel where they talk about, like, this is my body, like, this is my blood, do this in memory of me. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know there's lots more to it, why they think it is truly the body and blood of Christ. Um, and so I technically am not allowed to partake in that, um, Mm -hmm. because I'm not Catholic. And also because I'm, I would be honest, I actually don't know what I believe on that front. Um, Mm -hmm. because I think that there's really good discussion and reasoning why people think it is the literal body and blood of Christ. And then also good discussion and reasoning why they think it is metaphorical. So like a lot of the other things Mm -hmm. he said in the Bible. Um, but regardless, if you don't believe that you cannot partake in that. Cause like, I mean, that's, if it is the literal body and blood of Christ, that's pretty disrespectful to go up and be like, I'm just going to take this bread. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I mean, the same thing goes for like a Catholic who is a Catholic, but doesn't actually believe it's the literal body and blood of Christ. They shouldn't be taking communion. It's at least mm-hmm. in my understanding from what he's explained to me. Um, so I can't take communion, which is honestly a really big part of the mass. So like, that's, that's actually the reason that they meet every week, not for the yeah. homily or the songs or the, like it's for that aspect of worship because um, 
it's instituted, like the Lord tells us in the Old Testament why this is how we're supposed to Mm -hmm. worship, and then the Lord's telling us in the New Testament this is how we're supposed to worship, and so they're going for that aspect of worship. Um, Yep. So I can't do that, and then he also can't then take communion in uh, Protestant churches with me, because it's not the literal body blood of Christ from that perspective, Mm -hmm. and so if he thinks it is the literal body and blood of Christ, to him it's just bread and wine, which not wouldn't be sacrilege, but I mean, mm-hmm. he's coming at it from this is how you're supposed to worship. And if it's not actually that, I'm not going to partake in it. Um, other than that, though, like anytime they do like special services, like Ash Wednesday, I can go and get ashes. Um, mm-hmm. I can um, I can actually still go through the communion line and get a blessing. And so actually, normally yeah. I take Micah and I go up together and they bless us both. And then because um, mm-hmm. Micah's too young to do communion, even if he wanted to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, don't they and, say, may the Lord bless you and keep you? What I forget what they say when you are too young to receive it or maybe not, haven't done. It's RCIA, right? When you become it a member of the was, Catholic Church. It is now a new, it's Something they, else. within the past year, they changed what it what the stands <laughs> I've for. I've been out a couple years. No, like literally just changed it like in the past okay. year. I can't remember what it's called though. Um, but yes, yeah, so you can still go up. I just don't remember what exactly the words are that they say. Um, I should know that. That's really bad on me because I've been doing that for <laughs> weeks now. Um, but like, and I, but I can only, we can only go up and get blessed by um, a priest or a deacon. So if it's like mm-hmm. a lay person up there giving communion, like we can go through the line, but they can't bless us in that same way. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, like the rest of stuff, like we both do the Lord's Prayer together, uh, most of the songs together. Um, mm-hmm. I remember when I first went, I would be diligent and like really reading through the song and like listening through the songs and things before I would sing it. Cause I was like, mm-hmm. I don't want to just like lip service sing this song if I don't agree. Um, or if I don't really understand what I'm saying, cause like, that's not any good for me to sing a praise to the Lord. If I'm like, nah, I don't agree. Yeah. Um, and I think he does that sometimes in the Protestant service too. Like he like kind of goes through the words and he's like, I don't know. Like, I'm not sure if that's like Jalen right with me or not. And so mm-hmm. like, if he, either doesn't understand or doesn't feel like it's glorifying the Lord all the time, then he also will kind of like step back and kind of just listen. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, like technically I could, we, we both do a lot of the stuff together. So like he volunteers for St. Vincent de Paul, which is a really awesome um, organization that does a lot for poverty stricken people in all across America, yeah. actually. There's but, a thrift store I just went to that's literally there that I got awesome stuff like work clothes for Saul and yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. uh, we have a dresser there, right? Well, we did have a dresser there, so it might still be there. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> but we volunteer. So, like, he volunteers for them, and I've gone to, like, help out with various things for that. And, like, he can mm-hmm. help out with various things at Church Next Door from a volunteer perspective. So, yeah. I mean, main, main, main thing is communion, honestly. Communion, um, yeah. And I know there were a few things with your wedding, right? The The process of actually getting married. I want to talk a little bit about that and then also talk a little bit about raising a son together and some decisions that you've made in different denominations. But just to kind of touch on what you just said, I think one of the things that I've admired the most about the both of you is you're not just like going through the motions to keep your marriage afloat or like Mm -hmm. anything like that. Like both of you have taken investigative and like thoughtful, intentional steps to understand the other person's worship and perspective. And that's really what I want to emphasize in this episode on denominational differences is when we start to understand, like you've said this so many times that when you talked about your similarities and not your differences, that's when you realize like we're all servants of Christ and how we choose to worship as long as it's nothing inherently glaringly stated against in the Bible is permissible. Like, I don't know, Paul Paul wrote, I forget where this is in the Bible, but he wrote, test everything, but hold on to what is good. And I think too often we're so quick to snap and judge and look at the differences that we forget to hold on to the good parts. And um, yeah, that's just been a cry in my heart is, is just unity in the church. And so, yeah, I just want to hear about your marriage a little bit and how that looked but how you um, obviously did go to become married, even though there's big differences between sure. the Protestant church and the Catholic church when it comes to marriage. So for to be married in the Catholic church, it's a sacrament. Um, so for those of you that are not Catholic that don't know what sacraments are, there's like seven or nine. I don't remember offhand how many there are, but like baptism is one of them, confirmation, first communion, um, 
wedding. Some, some of them, like people do all of them. Some of them people don't do all because like not everybody's going to get married. Not everybody's going to get, get last rights where it's something that you can get right before you die, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but with us getting married in the Catholic church, there are like certain things that are stipulations for it to be a sacrament. Um, Mm -hmm. and not like bad things, like from a lot of the discussions that we've had, because like sometimes my bigger thing is I'm always just like, well, why is it this way? And a lot of times it is the way that it is to make it like regulated. So like if you go Mm -hmm. to a Catholic wedding in like Italy, it should be similar to a Catholic wedding here. And so like, you know that they're going to have these core components. They're going to have the gospel or they're going to have the Lord's prayer. They're going to have these blessings, the same vows. Like, you know, that like when someone says their vows together, like this is what they're saying to make that covenant with each other. Um, Mm -hmm. not just like a, yeah, I want to be married to you. Like, no, like this true covenant with each other. And so, um, there are different aspects of it that needed to be in place for that reason. Um, and, but it was nothing crazy. Like, I mean, we could have even had my pastor come too, if we wanted. So Mm -hmm. it was allowed to be a priest and a pastor, but the priest had to be the one I think that said the gospel. Um, we didn't have to have communion actually. Um, and we Mm -hmm. chose not to, because I wanted to be able to partake in everything together on our wedding day. Um, so we chose not to have communion. Um, but you do have to have like, um, gospel readings, the kind of like, it feels similar to a mass and you're not allowed to write your own vows. Um, mm. which initially I was like sad about, cause I really wanted to write my own vows, but, um, I'm not against at all the reason why they don't let you. Cause like, again, they're trying to make sure that you guys fully understand that like your vows are this covenant with each other. And like, these are all right. the things you're agreeing to. Um, and this is like a binding contract with each other. Mm-hmm. And so like sometimes people write their vows and that's not any shade at somebody that says like, I vow to clean up the cat's litter every day or something like that. Cause <laughs> hopefully you do, honestly, if you said that, um, <laughs> but like this really deep level is what they're trying to get at for it. Um, so we had to make sure those things were in place and you have to get married in a Catholic church. So mm-hmm. the reception can be wherever you want, but like the ceremony itself needs to be in a church. Um, and that's something that he, it makes He's not like upset per se when Christians choose not to get married in a cat like in a church mm-hmm. in general, but it's like you're making this covenant with God. And so he yeah. really like loves that that's a big aspect of it. Um mm-hmm. so for like the marriage itself, those are the main stipulations of it from there. Um and then the church we got married and had some other like random stipulations, but that was like church specific. And I think that could have been like venue specific wherever you went. Like when mm-hmm. I wasn't allowed to hang my dress on a door. And I think it was because like someone had probably done something to the door and hurt it or something. Like I huh. I don't know. But that was nothing like Catholic specific. Um and then like for our marriage, um, because you asked like about our marriage too, right? Yeah. Uh, I asked about what the marriage process looked like oh, yeah. with two different denominations. And then also your son. Yes. Kind of things you've decided for him. So kind of going forward then, uh, we've been married for six and a half years. Um, mm-hmm. We really tried to figure out kind of where our balance fit. And I think when we were discussing having children, what we've talked about and what we have been kind of deciding too is like, how do we want to raise them? Because obviously there are some differences in it. And mm-hmm. um I, I actually just told my husband last night that I'm actually really glad he's Catholic. He has this beautiful faith. Like he loves mm-hmm. the Lord so wholeheartedly. Um, yeah. and he is like this loving servant and tries to embody Christ at everything that he does. Um, mm-hmm. and there's, so there's this really wonderful piece of faith that I want my son to have. Like, I want him to see, yeah. um, like he, he fasts every Friday, um, he used to fast once a month. And during his fasting, when he would do that during his intention, his intention would be for me. And like, Mm -hmm. he's just like, like we did, um, washing of the feet at our wedding. And like, he just wants Jesus to be present. He wants to like worship Jesus wholeheartedly in the way that he has been asking us to. Um, and Mm -hmm. so I want, I want that. I want my son to see that. Like that's, so from some of the like other Protestant men that I've dealt with, like I don't know them on this level, so I'm not sure of the like depth of their faith. Mm-hmm. But my husband has this really, really wonderful faith, um, and so like I want him to see that. And then also, I mean, we're married, and he also think like likes my faith and thinks that I am a woman of God and striving mm-hmm. to love Jesus and striving to love our son in that way. So it kind of boils down to we want our son 
to know the Lord and we want our son to know Jesus. And that's like the heart and core of what we want him to see. And then we kind of want him to see both sides. So we want him to see Catholicism and we want to see Protestantism. Um, Honestly, I told him recently, one of the things I would love is it's never going to probably exist, but is like this blend of non-denominational and Catholic. Um, Mm -hmm. Because there's really beautiful things in the Catholic side that I feel like sometimes we lost in the Protestant side. Like, I think sometimes there's so much of an emphasis on Jesus being our friend, which he is, um, that we've kind of lost some of this holy, awe-inspiring admiration of this God of the universe who, like, did smite people in the Bible and Mm -hmm. also, like, created the universe at, like, the drop of a word. Like, it just, I think sometimes we've lost that, like, just not bad, like, I'm afraid of the Lord, but that awe-inspiring fear of the Lord. Um, Mm -hmm. Like, reverence. like Yeah, the reverence reverence. aspect, yes. Sometimes I don't feel like that is as displayed, and um, there's just, there's a lot of beauty in the Catholic Church. Like, a lot of the reasons they do the different things that they do, like the incense and the way that they do music and all of the beautiful imagery and stuff, is to help not to just be, like, an idol where you're like, I cannot worship without the incense, but it's Mm -hmm. intended to, like, infiltrate your senses to then, like, Mm -hmm really gets you into the mindset to give the Lord your heart and your worship. Um, Yeah. And then on the other side, though, like things we've talked about a lot with the Protestant church, like at least from what he's seen, and I know this is different in every Catholic church, um, Mm -hmm. but generally Protestant churches are a lot better at small groups from what we've seen, like at least Mm -hmm. getting into that um, mindset of kind of being able to connect with people like more with like outreach and evangelizing and, um, I think there's like that level of, I like the music on and like Mm -hmm. um, Protestant services too. Sometimes I feel like that's easier for me to really, really get into like a sense of worship. doesn't have to be that kind of music. Um, And at the end of the day, it's not about how I feel about it. Like it's really, am I glorifying the Lord with my worship? Um, And I like sometimes the fact that we get more than like 10 minutes of a sermon and there's just like, a different level of connection there too. So like, we'd like him to see both. Um, and we both discussed, like he can then choose. So if, and at the end of the day, all of your children are going to choose what they want to do, but like, mm-hmm. we're not going to shove him down one way or the other. If he chooses that he's like this, I think Catholic faith is right and true. Then that's the way we're going to encourage him. And if he mm-hmm. is like, no, I really think Protestant faith is like right and true. And he wants to go that way. then we're going to encourage and love him that way. Now, yeah. if you think that atheism is the right way, we're probably going to have to have some discussions. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, like, my bigger thing was that, like, I'm not at all opposed to him doing, like, First Communion and getting confirmed. Mm-hmm. I just don't necessarily want it to be, like, okay, you are in second grade or first grade whenever they do. Um, I think that's your First Communion. It's like, I don't yeah. want it to just be, like, you're this age, so you're going to do it. Like, I want it to be, right. like, a, do you understand yeah like do you understand what you're doing like are you are you just going because everybody else is supposed to be going or do you get it and that would be the same for me on the other side like I don't want him on the Protestant side to be like everybody's walking in line to go get this bread I'm gonna go too like I want him (laughs) to fully understand what he's doing before he does that because like no matter which side I think you go you can be pretty disrespectful to the Lord if you're just living giving lip service um So, like, I'm not opposed to him getting First Communion at that age, but I want him to fully understand and understand what that means for him and his life yeah. and um, where to go from there with that, too. So, mm-hmm. um, that's kind of really like, res- yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I really respect that. And I think that that's so healthy because in my childhood, not to talk about myself because this one's about you, but I uh, I still remember when I was about 16 or 15, I think is when you go through first confirmation or your confirmation in the Catholic church. I had already gone through first communion and, and all that. I denied my confirmation. And that was like earth shattering in my family because I have three Catholic priest uncles. One is a bishop. My dad is a deacon. And they were like, well, what, what do you mean you're not getting confirmed? Like, that that's what we do. That's what the family does. And I felt a call to the non-denominational church. And my dad pretty much said, like, in this house, this is what you do. Like, if you want to use the car, if you want to have a phone, if you want to, da, 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 you know, you're under my roof. And that just pushed me so far from the faith. I didn't know Jesus. I knew religion. And so mm-hmm. now my my relationship, my love for Jesus looks foolish to religion in a lot of ways. Um, but what I think is beautiful is that you have, you don't see each other as foolish, you and Christopher, you see each other 
as worshipful in two different ways, and you love each other still for it. And, you know, you had said that you wished that there was a blend of the Protestant church and the Catholic church, but I just want to, like, encourage you in saying that we are the church as God's Mm -hmm. people. And so forget the building, forget the title, like, you are that blended church. Like, your family is literally, literally representing that blended church and your son will too. Like it's not going to be in some aspects, it might be black and white. Like I'm choosing sure. Catholic this or Protestant this, but you know, how you're choosing to raise him is already that, that Paul unity that I talked about earlier, that, that blendedness. So what's something um, you hope Christians could learn from your situation uh, to anyone listening who is struggling with like familial denominational differences, or maybe similarly, they're interested in someone who's a different denomination. What's, um, and I want to be sure to say, we're talking about Christian denominations. You had mentioned like Judaism to Christianity is not equally yoked. Being Muslim to Christian is not equally yoked. And that's not to say that we don't still have love for people of different faiths, but making sure that you worship the same God is so important in any relationship, especially like a romantic one. So Mm -hmm. um, to rephrase that question, what's something you hope Christians can learn from your situation? I think that one of the biggest things I learned and I would love for people to understand is that there are a lot of misconceptions on each side, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, So I feel like when I went into our relationship, I went with all of these stereotypes and like, I mean, stereotypes come from truth generally. So like, I'm not saying that it wasn't something that had happened, but like, it definitely is not a blanket statement. So like my understanding of Catholicism was like a Catholic wedding that I had gone to where everybody was drunk. And so my brain was like, I just get drunk all the time. Like, and Mm -hmm. like, which is not true. Um, And just kind of the fact that I'm like, they just go and they have to do all of these things. And if they don't do these steps that they do, then obviously they don't feel like they did it right or they're not saved. And like, um, so like I was coming at it from that perspective. And when he came into it too, like, and there's, this happens, I think to some extent a lot where he was like, well, what I've heard is that from a Protestant side, like there's such an emphasis on grace that sometimes people are like, well, the Lord saved me so I can do whatever mm-hmm. I want. And that's not right yeah. either. Like, then, so like, that was some of the stuff where we were like seeing things separately. Like, yeah, there is that grace. Like nobody can save us except for Jesus. Um, mm-hmm. But like, it doesn't mean we just get to do whatever we want. Like there's, he, we're called to a higher standard and we're called to live our lives like Jesus. And that's what he's asking mm-hmm. us to do. Um, and so I think that would be my biggest thing is that, because you have this idea of what it is, doesn't mean it's correct. Um, and even yes. if a lot of the people that you're seeing do it this way, doesn't mean it's correct. Um, mm-hmm. cause like, again, like my understanding of what a lot of Catholics did and a lot of Catholics do this as do Protestants is the, the lip service, like people, even in the Catholic church from we're both in a, um, couples kind of couples, but just like a mixed Catholic small group that we go to together. Um, mm-hmm. and they talk about people being like nominally Catholic or Catholic in name only. And that's the thing where you're like, well, my family was Catholic, so I'm Catholic and I go to church and that's where it stops. Um, yeah. but like even on either side, no matter what aspect of it was with religion, um, there's that relationship piece. And I think that, um, even in the Catholic church too, like there's in the Bible in the year that we're listening to, it's, um, father Mike and that he was explaining, like, we have all of these things in place and there's a biblical reason why we do what we do. But like, if you do all of these things and you've lost that relationship with the Lord, it's no point. Like, Mm -hmm. and it's the same concept on the Protestant side too. Like if you're just going and you're like, Ooh, I'm singing a song and I'm, here and I listen to the service and then I'm going to go home and do my drugs or whatever I want. Like it's no better. Like it's at the end of the day, I don't think that really religion is wrong um, Mm -hmm. by any means, like the aspect of like religion versus relationship. I don't always love that concept because I think, Mm -hmm. I don't, I think religion with the aspect uh, with the absence of relationship is an issue. Um, but like, there's always that level of that relationship. And I think just trying to learn because don't get me wrong. Like there are things that Christopher loves his Catholic faith. And if you asked him, he would say Catholic faith is the best faith. Like, I mean, he's Mm -hmm. Catholic. So he's, he thinks that's the true and best way to worship the Lord. Um, And there are some things in it where he's like, this is correct and right and true. And like, that's black and white. And so I'm not, I don't want to belittle where I'm saying like, there's a blend. And he's like, well, there are these things because there are, Mm -hmm. Um, but there's just a level of learning. um, And I've actually found really great acceptance from people in the Catholic faith, even though I'm Protestant. And even during some of their homilies, they talk and they're like, well, 
um, like we need more Christian unity. Like they don't just single out mm. Catholics sometimes. Like yeah. it's a lot of times it's like we as a church need to do better. Um, and so I think that just, there's a lot more similarities than people realize. Um, yeah, I do think you need to be mindful and really do prayerful and discern because there are some denominations or some differences that are biblically incorrect. Like mm-hmm. this is against what the Bible is saying point blank. Um, and that's yeah. something you want to guard your hearts against. Cause that is something you don't want to just be like, well, they said they're Christian and I'm Christian. doesn't mm-hmm. matter that we're different denominations We're good. Like there are really heart and soul things that can be wrong. Um, yeah. But just because like you're a different denominations does not automatically mean you guys are both going to clash or is wrong or that there's no way to learn from each other. Because I've learned way more about him. My faith is deeper now because he's Catholic than if it hadn't been. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And something I love about this whole conversation is that you have spoken way more to Catholicism in this than you have your own quote unquote faith in in the non-denominational church. And that just shows that you are protective and I don't want to say defensive because you're not like defensive in a negative way, but in a like, no, like this is what I've learned way of your husband's faith um, with the understanding that he would probably speak to yours as well if Mm -hmm. I interviewed him. So I think that's really cool. I don't think I realized I was like speaking more to the Catholic side than I was to like my own Mm -hmm. faith throughout, which was interesting. Even like we've talked about before, like he still understands the idea of grace. So like if someone's not Catholic, that doesn't mean the Lord can't extend grace to save them. Like that's not right. Like, so he's not like, it's a Catholic only thing. Like when you get right. someone on their deathbed, that's never had any level of faith. And then they come to have a come to Jesus and they can still be like the Lord. The Lord is outside of our bounds. You can have grace for anybody. Right. Like, so I, I don't know. It's all that, uh, like drama, whether or not Jeffrey Dahmer was saved at the end. You know, I don't remember that at all. (laughs) Really? I'm really like, don't know a lot of news ever. At the end of his life, he supposedly accepted Christ (laughs) before he died in the hospital, I'm pretty sure. Which like, a lot of people were like, that that is so against God to even say he was a murderer. He was, and I mean, yeah, he did like horrific, evil things. But like, we don't know. I don't know his heart at the end and I'm never going to know his heart Some Christians would like crucify me for saying that, but like we we don't know. That's between him and God. And that's where like, we can't take place as judge. So I mean, I'm not, I'm not on the same level of horrifying, but like Moses murdered people. David yeah. had Bathsheba's, the person he like adulterated mm-hmm. with her husband Ur- murdered. Like, Uriah. Yeah. Ura- she Ura- sent your, Ura- he sent Uriah to his death. Like, I mean, I'm just, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I mean, Christianity is full of broken people, whether or not Noah, he was saved. I don't know. Noah got drunk and flashed his children. I mean, it, you know, <laughs> the a lot of goes broken, on. <laughs> there's a lot of brokenness in Christianity, yeah. like in, yeah. in our history. But I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, like none of us are ever going to know someone's true heart with the Lord. Like it's true. No matter what denomination you are or what yeah. you say, like, you're not going to know. I, absolutely. I think a lot of den- denomination comes down to worship preference. And like, that's where it's like, who is the most regulated by the Holy Spirit? Almost people are fighting to be like, no, this, this denomination is from the Holy Spirit. Like, but we're all trying to do the same thing aside from like Mormons and uh, like, um, seventh day Adventists or Jehovah's witness. I consider those extremely different than Christianity. Yeah. You know, but we're all trying to do the same thing, which is worship God. Well, I, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, I do think there are some things that the Lord says, like, this is what I'm asking of you. And like, we mm-hmm. need to take that into account, like, cause he's telling us point blank, this is what he wants us to do. Um, yeah. but even like when we were, we were literally just talking about Exodus yesterday and all of the laws that they have and they have all of these laws, but there's this point where like, um, the priest would wear this thing on their arms. I can't remember what it's called. And they'd like wear this thing on their forehead or like on their door frame. And it boiled down to the, like, you need to love people and love your God. Like every time, Mm -hmm. like that's what it boiled down to, even in those laws in the midst of like Leviticus, like, yeah, you have all of these laws, but it was like, this is why I I need you to love me and love your love people. Like, and that's what Mm -hmm. he says in the new Testament too. Like, and I see like hearts divided in worship. I always refer to the story of David and I can't remember if his name is Nathan or Nathaniel. I'm pretty sure it's Nathan. I don't remember. I was going to say Nathaniel. Okay. So well, whoever <laughs> his like prophet was, it's either Nathan or Nathaniel. Sorry, brain people that I can't remember right now. But David sees, 
he's in this grand tent uh he's in this grand temple with like it's decked out you know with the finest stone masonry jewels gold all these things and then the ark of the covenant at the time was in a tent and he goes to nathan or nathaniel and says i'm going to build a, a temple a palace for the ark of the covenant to reside and god tells Nathan or Nathaniel to go to David and be like, no, stop. Like, I never asked you to do that. Mm -hmm. And so David, in his best effort by what he thought was the right way to worship and honor God, was going to do something. And God basically said, my presence is still enough, whether it's in a palace or a tent. Mm -hmm. And that's like our human brain. You know, sometimes we're just so focused on like, is the incense, you know, in the right gold canister, you know, that's, that looks the most beautiful and ornate, you know, is, is the worship, the production side of the worship as grand as we can make it with, with the smoke and the fog. And, and God, I feel like sometimes might just be calling us back to like that lowly worship where a tent residing his presence is enough. Yeah. And so I remind myself of that a lot when I get too hung up on like, what am I going to wear to church today? Or like, you know, different things mm-hmm. like that. Your relationship is really encouraging. And I think you guys are being the best parents that you can be for your son. Thank you. Taking it one day at a time and just, you know, learning from your dad, your heavenly father, how to be a good dad and a good mom to your son. So uh, I think you're just, I think you're awesome. You know, I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, so Kelly, I just want to say thanks so much for joining us today on Christ in Me. Uh, to anyone who's listening to this, I know we didn't really touch on Bible translations. I want to do that in a full episode, like the different Bible translations, why there's so many, which one quote unquote is the right one. Because some people have really strong feelings about this. Um, So that's something I do want to dig into, maybe even with you, because Kelly has such a great theological understanding of of a lot of different aspects of the faith in the future. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being honest about your story. And hopefully this encourages some people out there. So thanks for being here. I'm Addie. I'm Kelly. And you're listening to Christ in Me with Addie.